Hello, everyone. I can see that we have some people in the chat already from San Diego and Canada and North Carolina and Central Ohio. So welcome, welcome, welcome to all of you. In case you don't know me, my name is Julie Fay Fan Balzer, and I am an artist and an instructor. Uh, and I this is my home studio. This is the attic of our house, and it's the place that I call my happy place on earth. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about design. Boot Camp, which is a five-week immersive course that's coming up in January. And I'm also going to do a little mini class, composition class for you, uh, which is going to basically help you to understand sort of what you are learning in Design Boot Camp. So I see we have more people checking in from Arizona and from a little further out in Massachusetts than I am. Um, so the supplies that you'll need for later in class just to go over um, are a piece of art that's sort of not quite right, just doesn't sit well with you, um, a sketchbook or some loose paper, something to write with, and then your favorite art supplies. Now, the reason that there aren't specific art supplies on the list is because one of the things about boot camp is that it's designed for you to be creative in whatever medium you like to be creative in. So we've had people who were alcoholic artists, um, jelly plate artists, um, stamp carvers, water watercolorists, mixed media artists, people who painted florals, who did landscapes, who only did abstract, who only did portraits. So it really is designed for you to be the best version of yourself. Okay. So, uh, and hi, thanks so much to everybody else who's coming in. And thanks, Georgia, for saying that I am an amazing teacher. I appreciate that so much. I see hi from Maryland. Um, Hi from Alabama, from Switzerland, from Canada, from Texas, from Charleston. It looks like there are people from literally all over the world, which is amazing. And of course, in Florida, I always love to hear that my little boy is totally adorable. So thank you. I'm a proud mama. Okay, so very, very quickly, um, the origins of Design Boot Camp came out of the fact that at least a decade ago, I started studying the design elements and principles. Now, these are not things I made up. You can look here on YouTube, you can Google, you can find them in books. These are the building blocks of art and literally any work of art you see is based on these ideas. OK, and so when I started to really study them and get into them, I found that I was able to talk about art. I was able to sort of drill down what my style was. I was able to fix problems in my art. I was able to start talking about other people's art and why I liked it. I just felt like it opened my brain and changed my art. And that's really the point of Design Bootcamp is to give that to you. So uh, every we basically Design Bootcamp meets twice a week for five weeks, Mondays and Thursdays from 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern. It meets on Zoom. So I can see you. You can see me. We can have a conversation. There is always a lecture that's part of it. And that lecture is given via PowerPoint. So it's going to be somewhat similar to what you see here, where we will talk about, let's say, the element of point or mark, um, show you lots of examples, talk about exactly what it is, go through some examples in art so that you understand where to see it, what it means, et cetera, et cetera. There's always a homework assignment. Um, and it basically is that simple as we go through all the elements. Then, of course, there's you showing your homework, us discussing. There are exercises in class. So you can see it's very intensive. Now, uh, even though it's on Zoom and we all know that Zoom can be recorded, it is not recorded. And there are a couple reasons for this. One is I think that it is incredibly vulnerable to share your art in process. So this is art that's not done, art you feel nervous about, you know. And so it's really nice to just have 10 people that's all. 10 people who just are you're there to support you, to be part of the camaraderie, and it's not recorded, and it's just, you know, in the moment. The other reason is I think it's really important to come to class. It's a commitment. One of the reasons I named this boot camp is not because I'm screaming at you, but it's because it really is a commitment. This requires you to be really interested deeply and truly committed to the idea of improving your work and studying and really being with me for five weeks and not just on the days of class. We do actually have a Slack channel that we talk in. Now, if you don't know what Slack is and you're confused by technology, don't worry, because one of the things I ever still remember from the last boot camp I taught is there was one student who wanted to drop out of boot camp because she was scared she wouldn't be able to get the technology. And I said, please, 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 please just try. Just try and see if it's okay. And you know what? 
It was. And afterwards, she said, I'm so glad I stayed and I'm so glad you helped me. And it was so much easier than I thought. So don't be intimidated by any of that. It's just a way for us to have a lot of communication. Okay. So thanks for checking in, everybody. I really appreciate that. Um, if you have any design bootcamp questions, let me know. But I want to get started with our composition exercise. And I just want to say, you know, like I said, all of these elements and principles are things that you can find anywhere. So bootcamp is really for people who are interested in finding a mentor or a guide, who are interested in the camaraderie of other artists on the journey, you know, who are interested in accountability. We all have resolutions, right? Starting January 1st, but how many Many of them actually last throughout the year. So this is a great way to meet up with the people who are going to keep you accountable. Class is going to keep you accountable and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's jump in. I'm going to show you the work of art that I picked. So let me go ahead and see if I can't make the overhead camera a little bit bigger. Okay, <clears throat> so um, this is the work of mine that I picked. It's not that I hate it. It's fine, but it just doesn't quite work. There are a couple problems with it. So the first trick here is to kind of analyze what's happening, okay? So you might have noticed this checklist that I have. This is just a quick um, checklist of these are the elements and these are the principles, okay? Um, and so one of the things that I'm going to go over right now when I look at this is I'm going to break down what are the elements and what are the principles, you know, that I'm using here so I can kind of analyze what I'm doing. So this is very easy because, again, I have the checklist. And I do see there is a question from Kathleen or Kat who says, are the slides from the PowerPoints available for us to download? So the answer is yes, for bootcamp students, you at the end of bootcamp, you get all of the slides to keep forever in a lovely book. Okay. Not in a book, but you know what I mean? In a big PDF that you can print, but it's like hundreds of pages. Just FYI, I probably don't want to print it. Okay. So um, I'm looking at this and I don't really see any marks or points. Okay, so that's interesting. There aren't any of those. Um, I do see some lines in the form of this text. So, okay, I'm going to check mark that. I'm going to say that my line is some text. Texture wise, there's some visual texture, but for the most part, and the visual texture is really in here. Now, if the things that I'm saying are confusing and you're like, Julie, I don't know what this is. I don't know what visual texture is. I don't know what this is. That's what Design Bootcamp's about, is so you understand. I'm just trying to give you a shorthand so you can understand really quickly, okay, what we're going to go over and the kinds of things you're going to learn. So there's some, but it could be more. It's really brush stroke where I'm seeing any visual texture. And you can go down this list with your own work. So color hue. So this, I think, is one of the more interesting things. So if a color wheel is yellow, blue, red, those are your primaries, then you have orange, blue plus red is purple. I don't know why purple is the only one that I decided to write out and spell incorrectly. Uh, and then blue and yellow is going to be green. Then in here, you're going to have a yellow green. You're going to have a blue green, sometimes called teal. You're going to have a what is called blue violet. You're going to have a red violet. You're going to have a red orange. And then you're going to have a yellow orange. Okay. So let me look and see which colors I have used here. Well, I have yellow, I have green, I have yellow green, I have blue green, I have a uh, violet here, I have orange, I have uh, a form of red here that's a dark red, I have, um, what other colors do I have in here? Do I have some blue? Um, so basically, what I can tell by looking at this is that I have used like every color. I mean, I like color, but that's probably not a good idea. So one of the things I'm going to write on my checklist here with color is maybe limited palette. Let's try this again. That would probably help this a lot. So value and saturation. If you learn one thing, if you study one thing, value should be it. Value makes the biggest difference in your work. So let me just show you this really quickly. I have a grayscale version of this piece 
You should be able to see it right here. Um, and what you can see, what you can see in this, oops, where did my, things are disappearing. Sorry, let me try to pop that up again. There you go. So there's my grayscale version. And what you can see in the grayscale with the color removed is you can really see the design. Okay. And I can tell that, for instance, this lower right quadrant, right, doesn't seem to have a lot of the dark values. Uh, and then I can see that like it's really top heavy in a funny way. So those are some things that I can address once I look at the value. OK, and in class, one of the things I'll teach you is how to use one of these value scales to really evaluate your work and figure out where you could improve. OK, so next bit of analysis that I want to do is I want to go down and I want to look at how am I using space? Not well is the answer. I need probably some more resting space. Um, so how am I using form, the element of form? I don't really have any. I do have a lot of shapes. And so some of the shapes I can see are circles, sort of a rainbow shape, some lines, um, maybe some dash marks, and then sort of half a leaf on each side. So half a leaf. So I've gone down the checklist of elements. So if you're working with me, you've gone down your checklist of each of the elements, what they look like, you know what I mean, how you're doing in this. And now you have an assessment where you kind of already know the problems. We don't even have to get into the principles, which is how you do things. So just to remind you, the elements are the ingredients. They're the things that make your food, right? That make your art. It's like if I give everybody in this room right now, I can see that there are 60 of you here right now. If I give you all spaghetti, um, white wine, shrimp, marshmallows, graham crackers, and some fish, we might have some similar dishes that come out, but we might have some wildly different things. Some people will divide them into two dishes. Some people will put them all together. Some people won't use all the ingredients, right? So the ingredients are the things that we all have available to us. And that's the elements of design. We all have the ingredients. Now, you may have special ingredients that you like that you are known for, right? You're a certain flavor. And you're just like a chef may be known for creating certain kinds of food. You're an artist who's known for creating certain kinds of foods. And that's your style. OK, so when we start to break down the elements in class, what you start to realize is what your style is. What are the shapes you use a lot? What kind of lines do you often use? Are there colors that you stick to? Is there a certain way that you use value? You know, all of that is your style. Now, you can change, do you know what I mean, your style. You can adapt your style if you want. But most of what your style is, is the stuff that's naturally attracted to you, or you're naturally attracted to, I should say. It goes both ways. But the bigger issue is most of us are speaking with a tiny little art vocabulary. Most of us are speaking with the same vocabulary that my two-year-old son is, where he says, mama, go, right? Instead of mommy, I would like to go. So imagine the difference, right, when you're creating art where the only vocabulary you have is mommy go, as opposed to being able to create art where you can say, dearest mother, would it be possible perchance for us to travel a bit and head on out on an adventure into the wild, right? That's a different, that's a much more elegant, bigger piece of art. And so that's the same idea here, which is when we break down the elements, we're trying to figure out how to open up your art vocabulary, not to change who you are, but to expand on who you already are. OK, so the next thing is the principles. And like I said, the principles are how you use the elements. Now, there are certain kind of rules, but I don't think of them as rules. They're guidelines about how you're using the elements. These are meant to help you. And what you need to do, and this is both the frustrating and amazing part of studying this, you need to decide for yourself how these principles apply in your mind. Okay. It isn't black and white. It's lots of gray. So let's get into it. Okay. So here is the overhead look again. Here's the piece that I'm working on. I already know what I kind of had a problem with with my elements. Now I'm going down my principles. 
So the first principle is movement. And again, if you don't know what these principles are, don't worry. You can look them up in a book. You can look them up on YouTube. You can take design boot camp. You can do find all sorts of ways to understand what these are. So movement. Yes, movement is one thing I am always good at. Sometimes there's too much movement. And movement really means, does this piece feel like it's in motion? Does it have some motion? I would say for the most part, I'm going to give myself a check there dominance. A lot of times people think of this as a focal point, and that's kind of a lie. I don't think all paintings have like a single focal point. Um, that's a cheat and it's really easy, but it's a lot more interesting if you can find layers of dominance, which is a big thing that we talk about in Design Bootcamp. So I would say ish. I'm not sure. I feel like there is definitely a subdominant layer and a dominant layer, but I'm missing that third layer. So I'm going to say dominance is something that I need to work on here. Variety. Well, there's certainly variety of color. We figured that out with the color wheel, didn't we? I'm using every color all at once, apparently. Um, there's variety in shapes, variety in mark making, but you know what? I noticed that there are a lot of heavy, like this line and this line is kind of the same weight. This and this feels obviously very similar. So I would say I could do better with variety. Could do better. Unity. Unity is the opposite of variety. So variety is that there's a lot of different kind of stuff going on. So it's not boring. Unity, the question is, does it feel unified? Does it feel like a complete composition? And I would say I have some unity problems. I have some unity problems. Part of it is that the colors are crazy. Part of it is the design. So let's look at what the design of this actually is. Okay, so there's like a strip on the side. There's a small section and then a small section and then a big section. There's this big thing coming in here. Then there's a leaf thing here. There's a leaf thing here. And then there's like something happening down here. Okay. That is a lot of stuff and not particularly uh, sort of well put together or unified. So how can I change that? Well, I could probably change it a lot of different ways, but very simply, could I take this large element and keep it because I like it and then keep this small element again because I like it. And then instead of having this big dividing line or these random leaves and all these little sections, could I just create maybe something that went back here. This design is so much more simple and elegant, right? Than this kind of hot mess of stuff that's happening over here. So it feels to me like, okay, I'm getting a sense of this is a more unified composition. Do I have contrast? I do. Contrast is another thing I happen to be good at. Proportion. Are there things that feel... So proportion is like if you had... If you drew a person... I'm just going to draw a carrot with arms and feet. Okay. It looks like a dolphin person. And then you had their head be like this. Their head is out of proportion and we can understand that. But if they have a head like this, their head is probably more in proportion. And now they just have a really cool big Afro, right? So when you're doing abstract art, proportion is the same thing. And I can actually see here that this design is more, has more proportion in it. And this has less, right? Because this thing versus this, like the sizes aren't quite right. So proportion is about relationships between things. Um, rhythm. <laughs> rhythm is one of my favorites. And if you think about music, then you'll understand rhythm. Does your piece have rhythm? So rhythm, line, line, line goes right? Even like the circles here going boom, 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 boom. But then they also have circles here going boom, 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 boom. But then there are also circles here going. Dee -dee 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 -dee. So yes, I think this has rhythm. There's music in it. And that's one of the reasons I often tell people, right? You probably, if you've ever watched a stencil video of mine, you know that I tell people to buy the big 12 by 12 stencils and the small six by six stencils because you want to have rhythm. You want to create some big and some small at the same time so that things have rhythm. You don't want to just use the same exact thing over and over. So if you love circles, 
I don't think there's any harm in collecting a thousand different like stamps, stencils, screens, whatever that all have circles because you're going to use them together to create really interesting rhythm. Now, rhythm is not pattern. And that is something that we discuss a lot and people get confused about in Design Bootcamp. But it's important to understand the difference between rhythm and pattern. Um, and then finally, balance. Is this piece balanced? And I think it's easiest to see balance when you look at grayscale. So here in the grayscale version, if I were to divide this into four quadrants, I could easily see that it is not balanced. I think I said this earlier, this lower right quadrant really makes it unbalanced. Okay, so what am I going to do with all of this incredible information that I now have? Well, I'm so glad that you asked. What I'm going to be able to do is not only talk to you about sort of what I like about the art and what I don't, but also be able to now create a piece based on this piece that is improved. This is how I become a better artist, okay? And so let's do this together. So here is my sketch that I did of sort of where I'm headed. Here is my original piece, which I'm just going to put over to the side so I don't get it all yucky. Um, I have, if you've taken my art parts class or heard about it, one of my theories of mixed media creating, um, and I will just say this very briefly, it's not related to boot camp really, but if you want to be a really quick creator, it is kind of related to boot camp though, because I was able to start making art parts once I figured out my personal style. So what art parts are is like, I have a whole section in here that's called backgrounds. So I don't have to sit down now. Let's see if I can get that in the camera called backgrounds. So I don't have to sit down right now and create a bunch of backgrounds because I have a bunch of backgrounds that are already my style. I have, I use these in my art journal all the time. I have a ton of little compositions. So I know this just looks like a bag of nothing, but when I pull it out, you'll see that like, this is already, whoops, there you go, stitched together, stamped, you know, and done so that I can create art instantly. So these are art parts and they're what allows me to really think about that stuff. Okay. So I am going to grab my backgrounds and let's see how we can get, you know, with our sketch here. So here is my backgrounds. Um, and you can see I have some gelatin printed. I have some painted. This is would actually be a really nice. I have some really busy things. I have some overall patterns. This one might be good. Um, and again, like what is a background? Well, that really depends up to you for some people. Oh, I like this. I like all these text ones, although that's too busy. Mm, maybe this one. Oh, this has the nice vertical. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do now is kind of evaluate based on the things I said here. Well, one of the things I said is I want to work. I'm looking at my list. I want to work with a more limited palette. So this is already pink, yellow, and green. This is kind of blue, yellow, and pink. This is much more limited. It's just warm colors. So that might be a good guess. This one is some high contrast here. So I'm not sure about that. I feel like these two, which are sort of calmer color palettes, are a better choice for me since I want to work in a more limited way. Now, if I look at these and I compare them to this kind of sketch that I made here, this one actually feels like this sketch, but just reversed. Can you see that? This area is this little square. So maybe all I need to do here is something really simple. So let's see, I wanna keep it in the yellow, orange, pink, sort of warm family. And I wanna sort of keep things in the rhythm and in the storytelling that I had, right? I had a lot of um, warm colors, so what can I do? I also had a lot of circles in the original. So can I find some circles or maybe some lines? This is a warm, this is half of this paper's in the pink. This is sort of, you know, I just have my collage papers kind of at the ready. White is always a neutral. Here's an orange, but I'm leaving all my blues and those kind of colors in here and not pulling them out. 
Um, I have some writing. No blues, no blues, but I'm just going through to see what I have that is in the kind of right frame. I think a lot of people use collage papers that are too pretty. This kind of stuff is really great. Okay, so um, I am going to start with my background and then I'm going to think about this big dominant shape. And I'm thinking a little bit about value. I'm thinking a little bit about hue. I'm trying to keep all of those ideas in my mind at the same time while I'm looking at this. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab some scissors, cut off. This is obviously some gelatin printed paper. Um, and I'm going to just cut off the edges so that I can really see the design here. I think a lot of people get scared to use their collage paper and it is meant to be used. Okay, I'm going to cut sort of a big chunk here, just like this. Kind of like my sketch, except I'm going to move it over and flip it over maybe like this. Then I'm wanting a large sort of ovaly shape, maybe like this, coming out. So I'm just reversing my sketch here and you don't have to be a slave to your sketch, but it is just an idea. And then maybe I'll go digging for some art parts. See what I've got that might, oh, there's that red paper used. Again, interesting. Too many colors, probably. Mm -mm -mm. Maybe something black and white to really kind of stand out. And maybe it just needs a little base of something to make it slightly larger. So... Maybe this and this. Okay, so let's just evaluate for a second. Again, I'm using all of my design elements and principles. This is like maybe a simplified version of this. And now it just needs some zhuzhing to really get it to be a little more interesting. Um, I think that this paper is wrong. So I'm just going to pull that right out. It doesn't seem right to me. And so that's what I mean. You shouldn't be a slave to sort of things that you thought might work. You should go with what actually works. And then I think I'm going to get some lines out. Um, I think I have in here some different... Yes, I do. Some big stripes. So let's see what happens if I throw those behind and I pull this off. And I root that down there. Simpler color scheme. It now is starting to echo this quite a bit. There's the lines. That's a stripe. That's part of my style I like. I have the yellow. I have the orange. But it's calmer. I have reversed the big circle or the big, you know, shape but let's see how it looks if i put it the other way i don't like this design as much when it goes this way i think it actually is a much better choice for it to go this way and for it not to sit all the way on the edge okay and again i'm using the, my principles here so i can see that like there's a lot of darker value in these stripes there's a lot of dark value right here in this area that i created down here with all this black so now I need to find a way to kind of balance it out a little bit more. So I probably want to, maybe I can use this paper that I liked to create, to mimic some of these circles that I can see on the original. And create some of that movement that I gave myself a check for but now is lacking in this one. So I'm able to, I'm not, I, I know a lot of people talk about intuitive 
art and intuitive that. And I think that's fantastic that they have the intuition to do it. I use my intellect. And I think that when you understand the design principles and elements, it becomes intuitive once you've done the work. Once you've done the work to cement it in your head and really understand it, it becomes intuitive down the road because you've practiced it so much. But I don't think it starts that way, or at least it never has for me. So I think we're all different artists and we all create in different ways. I would never say that the way that I create and the way that I learn is the only way, but I would say it's a way that has been really helpful for me to feel excited about my work, feel good about myself as an artist, and feel empowered to create the kind of work that I wanted and to understand why the idea in my head isn't coming out on the paper. So that's really where design principles um, and elements have helped me so much, um, just in confidence level. Oh, I really like where this is headed. So you can see these circles. I took that idea. These stripes. I took that idea. This shape. I took that idea. And now I think we probably need just maybe one or two more little things to make it work for me. And that's the other thing to note. We're all different. We don't all like the same things. We all have different ideas. I'm just wondering, since this is so dark, if it has any place in here or if it's just too much. Mm, interesting. Maybe. Maybe, baby. Um, but we're all different and we all have different tastes. And Design Bootcamp is not about you being an artist like me. Design Bootcamp is about you being the best artist that you can be. Whoops. Um, you know, and part of that is figuring out your personal style. So very quickly, I'm just going to go down some of the questions and then we'll return to this after uh, we've had a moment to rest our eyes. Um, Georgia asks, why does her jelly printing look so sloppy, not blurry, but sloppy? So Georgia, a lot of that can be answered in my gelatin printing class, a year of gelatin printing, particularly in the first unit, which is about just simple acrylic paints. It's usually about um, the amount of paint that you have on the plate. Okay. So I hope that helps. Um, hi from Cyprus. That's awesome. All around the world. Uh, and Christine was asking, can anyone tell me what the first of the element was, the one before line? It was point or mark. Uh, Peggy says, what is the paper you're using to make backgrounds, watercolor paper? Oh, no. Oh, no, Peggy. It is just cheap cardstock from Staples. I just buy, I just go down the cardstock aisle and grab myself a ream of it, and I love it. Yep, and Florence has got it. It was Mark's. Thank you, Florence. Uh, and Georgia says the bottom right needs something. Okay, well, let's take a look back and see if the bottom right needs something. So one of the things is I have a very messy background here, and it can be difficult on a very messy background to see what is going on. So I'm just going to grab a file folder. This is a quick messy desk trick. But if you just get something a little more neutral, behind your work, then you might be able to sort of see it a little bit more to figure out what's happening. So I agree with um, Georgia that the bottom right feels a little empty. And I think what it probably needs is some stamping, some small mark making, because right now everything is the same sort of weight. So what I really need to do is glue everything down and then come through, I think, with some lines in a really shorthand way. Let's just, where's the pencil I was writing with? Does anybody else's desk always end up like this? Because I can't find anything. Okay, well, let's just, just use a different pencil. So yeah, I think it needs some kind of like, um, something like that, like lines um, or a little bit of motion and energy to just get it, maybe some little marks and points. And I will take some time to glue this down and I will email you all the finished composition when I finish it, right? Ah, Georgia approves. I love it. Thank you. Um, so, 
Uh, Lorna says, what are the tab labels on your folders? So these are just how I label my art parts. I do it by shape. So it's just like lines, circles, backgrounds, that kind of stuff, but it's totally up to you. Um, and a recommendation for an accurate paper trimmer. So you guys, you did not know this was going to be a big question, but I'll tell you this. Years ago, I got on the wait list Yes, a wait list for a paper trimmer, for a Genesis trimmer, which is the most expensive paper trimmer in the whole world. This is probably 12 or 14 years ago I got on the wait list. I think five years after I got on the wait list, I finally got the email that said, we have a Genesis trimmer for you. Do you want to pay us our ridiculous amount of money for this trimmer? And at that point, I was like, I'd been using a Fiskars trimmer, totally happy and fine. For years, I'd had to replace it multiple times, but they're so cheap. It was kind of like, whatever, you just replace it every year and it's fine. I love my Genesis trimmer. It is fantastic, accurate, awesome. It is wonderful. Um, I have also heard very good things, though I have never used it, about the Caterpillar trimmers, which I think are cheaper and you don't have to get on a wait list for it. So um, I also do a lot of cutting with a rotary cutter that's dedicated to paper. Okay. Um, Karen says, do you offer another design bootcamp this year? I'm traveling some in January, February. So so far, this is the third year I'm teaching design bootcamp. I only offer it once a year, partially because it also, it takes up an enormous amount of time and energy for me too. So I think I probably won't offer it again until 2023 and some, unless something insane happens. So this is the 2022 option. Uh, sorry, I hate to say that, Karen, um, but just so you know. Okay, uh, I always want to please everybody, but you can't always please everybody, right? Okay, so if there are any more questions, do let me know. I just want to tell you a couple last things about um, Design Bootcamp, which is, again, to remind you, it's about you creating your own personal style. It's just breaking down the elements and principles. A question that somebody asked me the first year is, do I have to create art like you because I don't like your art? <laughs> and the answer is no. Fantastic. Please don't create art like me. I want you to just understand these elements and principles. And so basically every week we meet twice a week. We go over the homework. You get a lecture. You get new homework. We do some exercises and some demos. Then in between classes, you spend some time doing your homework, talking on the Slack channel to other people in class, sharing things that you found, sharing information. And what I always say to people is, this is your class. It's kind of like exercise, which is to say, I don't care if you don't do your exercise. You're not going to be as fit, so to speak, as the people who do their exercises. You will have these exercises to do later. So if life happens, we're all human beings. People get sick. Children, you know, do things. Trees fall on your house. Whatever it is, that's fine. You're going to have all of the information to do later. I do encourage you to really try to make the commitment because I think it makes a big difference. And the people who have have left some amazing glowing reviews, which you can see at this URL right here, bit.ly design bootcamp 2022. You can see just a few of the amazing reviews that people have left. Um, a lot of the people who have come through Design Bootcamp have become coaching clients of mine and vice versa because it really is a as about as personalized as a group uh, class can get, okay? Um, Florence is asking, how much time each week do you recommend your bootcamp students spend? So I don't know whether you're a slow maker or a fast maker, but let's just look at the homework, for instance, on the elements. So here are just the assignments about um, the point or the mark that I showed a little bit. So on the left side, you can see, take a piece of paper and fill it with as many different points as you can think of. There are some tips there. And then you need to identify some point in your work and in some other work. Now, you usually probably have two to three assignments like this in a week. So, or like this between classes, I should say. So you can think about, does this seem like something that you'd be able to kick out in an hour? Or does it seem like something that you would need to commit a couple days to? And that's really about sort of how fast you work. Um, and again, that's totally personal to sort of who you are. Uh, and Estella says, do you ever offer boot camp at a later time or on the weekend? So I have offered it in the past at night. And I know that some of my um, students prefer the nighttime. I've also found that when people try to do two hours of boot camp after a full day of work, it's kind of a brain 
buster. So one of the things I've been toying around with with some of the people who do work Monday through Friday is figuring out if there's a way to do boot camp um, on like a longer session instead of a two, two hour sessions a week, maybe doing a four hour blast out on a Saturday or a Sunday to really like get that. But that's also a much bigger commitment in some ways because that's a long time to spend on Zoom. So the answer is I have in the past offered it on the night. I am considering a weekend. If these are things that you're interested in, the only way I'll know that there are people who are interested in it is if you email me. So you can always send an email to me at balls or designs two. That's the number two at gmail.com. And I'm very happy to hear sort of what works for you and what doesn't. Okay. So I think I'll just um, sort of wrap up by saying this, which is you're very welcome to talk to any of the people who've been through boot camp. A lot of them are all over in the Balzer Design Students Facebook group, which if you, um, you can find that right on my page at facebook.com backslash Balzer Designs. Um, and so they're happy to talk to you, tell you their experiences, tell you how much time they took, tell you whether or not it was a good or a bad experience, things that worked, things that didn't. For instance, I originally taught boot camp on Mondays and Wednesdays. And one of the feedback things was Monday to Wednesday wasn't enough time to do the homework. So that's why it's now Monday, Thursday, because that gives you a longer stretch. And then Thursday to Monday, it's kind of more of an even hour of time. Okay. Um, so Estella says that she will send me an email and Peggy looks like she's down for that too. So thank you. Um, I think that sometimes people don't realize how much I want to please you and I'm trying to work to make it work for you. So go ahead and tell me, you know, these are the kind of times that work for you. And once I see that there's a critical mass of people who it would work for, then I'm happy to offer it at a time that would work for you. Okay. So Thank you so much, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it was useful. And I will say just this last thing. Have I said that 12 times? This is really the last thing, which is um, even if you don't take boot camp, I think it is so worthwhile to study these elements and principles. They have made such a difference, not only in my artwork, but in my confidence level and how I feel about myself as an artist and how I interact with art when I go to museums and how I look at other people's Instagram posts. I mean, I, I know this is going to sound like hyperbole, but it has truly been a life-changing experience for me. And I think it is a gift that you give to yourself 100%. So however you get those design elements and principles, get them somehow. They're really worth it. Thanks so much for showing up. I appreciate your time.